So the next topic or reading that we'll discuss was the TED Talk by Tara Hoska, who's an indigenous woman, and it was titled The Standing Rock Resistance and Our Fight for Indigenous Rights. And just first and foremost, the, a quote that stood out to me uh, from her during her TED Talk was when she said, when you aren't viewed as real people, it's a lot easier to run over your rights. Uh, she also talked about in her TED Talk how much of the U.S. curriculum does not mention indigenous tribes, or if they do mention indigenous tribes, they only mention one tribe, uh, but there's many more than one tribe within an area. So uh, she just thinks that there's not enough um, within the U.S. curriculum that is teaching about modern tribes or modern native tribes. Uh, she talks a lot during her TED Talk about the building pipelines through indigenous territories. And although this isn't in a TED Talk, it is a uh, pipeline project that was talked about a lot in the media. It's the Keystone Pipeline and how it was shut down in 2020 by uh, President Biden. And part of the reason for it being shut down was because it went through indigenous territories. So it just shows it's one of many pipelines that are being built built through indigenous territories. Um, also, she talked about during her TED Talk how the United States Supreme Court stripped Native Americans in 1978 the right to prosecute at the same rate as anywhere else in the United, in the United States. And she talked about how a, na a non-Native can walk onto the reservation and rape someone, and that tribe is without the same level of prosecutorial ability as anywhere else. Uh, she said that the federal government denies those cases 40% of the time, but it used to be 76% of the time. So it just shows that the difference in the amount of rights that uh, Native Americans have in comparison to anywhere else in the United States, if you live on a uh, reservation. And then she talks about, uh, for a majority of the TED Talk, is about Standing Rock um, and how people were resisting the Dakota Access Oil Pipeline project from being completed. Um, she, for, just for example, when she was talking about Standing Rock, she talked about how the Native people told the courts of a sacred site in the path of, in the path of the pipeline, and the day after, the agency behind the pipeline skipped 25 miles ahead and destroyed the site, and now there's an ongoing lawsuit because of that. Um, she also talked about how uh, during the pipeline construction, pipeline security officers used attack dogs or were using attack dogs against Native people. And it just shows that these pipeline or the agencies behind the pipeline are uh, intruding on native territories, native land, and just taking away from native rights. Uh, she also talked about cultural survival and how uh, the native people uh, throughout time have used different techniques to try to uh, have their culture survive all these changing um, either their lands being taken away or their rights being taken away, just their culture surviving uh, that their rights being taken away. And then just one more quote that I found interesting from this TED Talk was that education is foundational. Education shapes our children and shapes the way we teach and the way we learn and how Washington State made the teachings of treaties and modern Native people mandatory in the curriculum. Uh, she said that was a good thing, but there's much more that needs to be done to uh, learn about the indigenous people and uh, the modern indigenous people. So my discussion questions for uh, this TED Talk, the first one is, what is the best way for people to learn about the indigenous tribes that genocide is being committed against? And then the second discussion question is, what can we do to stop the, these indigenous victims of genocide from having their land continually stripped from them? And now you can pause now if you want to answer that, but I will move on to the next one. And the next uh, material that we had for this week was uh, the documentary entitled uh, Inheritance. In 2009 it was published, and in this film, it was of two women. The uh, first one was a Nazi's daughter, and the second one was a concentration camp survivor. The Nazi daughter was named or is named Monica Hertwig. She was born in 1945 near Munich, and her father was Amon Guth, and he was the commander of the Pla Plazau concentration camp. 
and the uh, Jewish concentration camp survivor was Helen Jonas, and she was a survivor, and she lived in uh, Youth's uh, house on the concentration camp. She was one of the slaves in the house that uh, Amon lived in and his family. Uh, in this documentary, Helen and Monica met each other, and they met each other um, at the Plazau uh, concentration camp memorial site. And just some background uh, at the beginning of the documentary, uh, Monica said that no one talked about the Second World War in Germany. So Monica, when she was a kid, didn't really know about what happened during the Second World War. Um, and she also said that she knew nothing about the Jewish, Jewish people and that nobody from the young, younger generation knew uh, about what happened to the Jews. Um, and then with Helen, she said that uh, one of the slaves, she was Helen, and the other slave's name was Helena, but she was forced to change her name to Susanna because Amon said that she had to change her name. So it's just interesting seeing that the Nazis were just taking away a person's identity uh, during the genocide of the Jewish people. Um, and during the time that Helen and Monica uh, met each other, Helen described her experiences at the concentration camp. Um, she talked about, she, or they went to the memorial, and they also went to where Helen lived um, before she was at the concentration camp. Um, and it was interesting at the concentration camp uh, to see they did have an argument while they were at the, or while they were at the, uh, former living quarters of Helen, sorry. Uh, they had a disagreement because Helen believed that uh, Monica held the wrong beliefs about the Jewish people, which she did. She said, or Monica said that she was told when she was younger that the Jewish people were shot because of sanitary concerns, um, because that's what she'd just been taught and told. And Helen told her that that was wrong and that they were shot because they were Jewish. So it was just interesting seeing the different um, perspectives of the um, genocide. And then just an interesting quote that I heard during the documentary is, was by Helen at the memorial. Uh, and she said, we just can't be silent. We just can't push things away. They're there and you see they disturb our lives. My children are affected. All my, sur all my survivors' children, but we are traumatized people. And she also talked about her former husband, Yosef Jonas, and how he was affected. He was affected by, um, he would sit at the table that they, in their house and read the newspaper and repeatedly write down the name of his father. And it was just Solomon, Solomon, Solomon. And he was affected all throughout his life after being in the concentration camp. And he actually took his life later on. He committed suicide. Uh, and he left a letter when he took his life saying to uh, Helen, dearest, I can't go on. I'm being haunted every day of my life. Forgive me. So it just shows that these people are, these people of uh, victims of genocide are affected even after genocide. The genocide is completed. They're affected throughout their whole lives, and it, it's just never ending. Uh, so that is all I have to say for the documentary, and we'll move on to the discussion questions. <clears throat> so the first discussion question that I have is, what value do you see these face-to-face -face conversations, such as this documentary, is providing in the context of pre preventing or recovering from genocides? And then the second discussion question I have is, how do the children of genocide survivors or perpetrators work to heal uh, the wounds that genocide brings with it? 